I must thank uh, the congregation here at Forest Hill and the eldership for their invitation to come and be here and also to thank uh, those who have been involved with the activities of Memphis School of Preaching for these 52 years of lectureship programs and it's a delight on my part to be a part of speaking on this occasion to a subject of which 58 years of preaching the gospel now trying to do so as brother like brother uh, Thornton said trying to do that Have you ever heard the story brother Thornton told about himself on trying to preach and why he got to doing that well, J.A. Thornton was quite a, quite a character in and of himself, but he said when he first, he told me this himself, and he told audiences of which I've been a part of himself, that when he began to preach, he said that he put together a sermon, and he said he went out to this place to preach in the countryside up around where he grew up, around Tiplersville, Mississippi, up in that area, Enterprise and all that area. And he said, I preached a sermon that, no one could have ever understood. I didn't even understand what I was saying. He said, I had the middle at the beginning, and I had the end at the middle, and the beginning and the end. And he said it made no sense at all. And he said, I closed out the sermon, and he said, I went to the back there, and I stood there, and I shook hands as reverently as you could to the people coming out. And they were all complimenting me about saying the nice things about Good to have you here today. Nice to hear a young man preach. We're thankful for you preaching and so forth, so on. And finally, he said this little lady carried out herself. She was very short compared to him, and he was a head taller than I. And she came out, and she reached up and grabbed him by the collar and by his neck and pulled him down to where she could whisper in his ear. And she said, Brother Thornton, I got something really good out of this sermon you delivered today. And he said quickly, to this good day, and it was 50 years later, I don't know what it was that she got out of that sermon. <laughs> he said, but I know quickly, he said the following. He said, I know what she gave me. She gave me a word of encouragement to try preaching again. And so, therefore, with those words, he said, I've been trying to preach, and he was preaching to a 60-something years at that time, and he was happy to give that story about himself. <coughs> J.A. Thornton was much appreciated, much loved. And his work in the Delta, Mississippi, where I went first after leaving Freed Hardeman in 1965 uh, to Ruble in Sunflower County, is one of but four congregations with which I have worked on a day-to-day -day basis over these last, well, what are we talking about here? 50 years, 58 years. I've been blessed to be with elderships that were good, and wonderful people, laboring people, and I have been blessed to be with people who needed a helping hand to overcome what, as uh, Brother Waycaster said in his sermon earlier, if you heard that, the ways of the world. And I have worked with all those kind of situations with people with the love for the souls of these individuals as I grew up in a local rural congregation south of Kosciuszko. The Nile Church of Christ was there. And I grew up in that congregation. And I had uh, my grandfather and his brothers, my uncles and all there, part of that congregation too the uh, Cockrofts and the Pickle family and all of them, and my grandparents were the Lawrences. They were part of that congregation. And it was just south of Kosciuszko, Mississippi. And there in that community, we got to study the Bible and things, and there was a preacher who came there one time and illustrate how they did those particular things. And I, as a young person, got to watch those kind of things and it affected the spirit that I had in mind from the Lord about how to love people and care for them even when they were in dire sin and wrongdoing, even if they were in an eldership under fire because of their conduct or misconduct. And as a result of that, um, I was able to be there one Sunday morning when a preacher came to visit and when the ladies got up to go to the classroom with the little children to teach them and everything, 
He said, what's going on here? He stood up and he objected with a loud voice. What's going on here? What's happening here? Why are these women going back there? And the uh, question would come from my good uh, Uncle Walter and uh, Emmett. Uncle Emmett, what's wrong with this? Well, a woman's not supposed to teach. She's not supposed to teach at all. What in the world is she doing here going doing this? And immediately they said, Brother, is that all that verse says to you? Is that all that verse says to you? And he said, Well, it says plainly they're not supposed to teach. And usurp authority. And they then returned that word and said, Would you turn there to that passage in 1 Timothy 2 and would you read it fully? It not only says, Do not teach nor usurp authority over the man. Which one of these little children would you call a man going to this classroom today? Do you want to be the teacher of these little children? And they immediately said, no. <laughs> they didn't want that loud voice in their class at all. And there I was, a young man, witnessed all that type of thing. Later on, we had a, an aunt that went to Georgia. And she got in with the group that was set forth with non-institutional. And they had publications and bulletin articles and they were a plenty, and she would steadily pull them together and fold them up as I folded up this one today. She'd put them in an envelope, and she'd mail them to us there at the Nile Church to her brothers that she wanted to be sure understood the truth of the gospel, that there wasn't no children's home in the Bible. There wasn't any kind of thing like that going on and that you couldn't contribute to those people who were not members of the Lord's church, they were not Christians yet, and that you couldn't do that sort of thing. And so instead of the congregation there writing back and saying, you're all wet about this and you're wrong about this and why don't you check it further about this, they continued to receive those things and they called on Brother Pervy Nichols, who was a brother, our brother uh, Nichols, Brother Gus Nichols, and Brother Purvey, they told me, was responsible, really. You've seen the charts of specific and generic authority that Brother Gus Nichols did back through the years. And he did, but Brother Purvey, his brother, did a whole lot on those particular charts. And they talked and discussed and they worked together. And, then, and neither one of them took full credit for it. Neither one of them denied it because they all worked together and helped out preachers that came on Friday nights and studied how to preach there at Jasper, Alabama and did a, a super work in that work to, to be done. And so we called on Brother Purvey Nichols and Brother David Wade, who was preaching at Canton, Mississippi at the time. And Brother Nichols was down in Belvedere Church in Jackson. They came up one Friday night. Some of our first preaching done on Friday nights because on Friday evenings, that's when we all got together from milking cows and things like that. We all could get together and stay a little while for the Bible study. And Friday night was the night instead of Wednesday night there at the Nile Church. These studies went on, and I never will forget, and I still use today the very technique that Brother Purvin Nichols used that particular evening. We there sang a song and had a word of prayer and so forth and so on. And... Uh, Brother Nichols came up, stood in front of the communion table. He said, uh, brethren, he had a whispering kind of voice too, like Brother Gus did. He said, what have y'all heard about this subject? And one of them quickly said, there ain't no Bible for it. Another said, they're not members of the church, we can't help them. And on down the line he went with a description. He said, uh, brethren, he said, I, I hear silence. Is that all that y'all have heard about this? That's all that we've read about these bulletins that we've gotten and from Georgia and so forth. Okay. He then said the following. 
He said, you brethren are good Bible students here. He said, I know that you don't answer question for yourself. I grew up in that kind of a congregation. And so as a result of that, what happens is you in this building, do you have a right to be in this building? Do you own this property? Do you have a deed of trust for this property? Well, quickly somebody said, yes, we do. We certainly do. We bought this property we were in this building. To which he then said, would somebody turn to a verse in the Bible that authorizes the church to have a building like this? Own this property. And there was silence. You didn't hear page turn. You always heard a page turn in other questions, but you never heard a page turn. And that in all itself was a surprise. And here we go. And he said, brethren, he said, the Bible authorizes that without authority. We cannot do anything. We're to do all things by the authority of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God. And we're to do that thing in accordance with his will. And he said, the Bible teaches us just as much specifically. What's the Lord's Supper? Unleavened bread, the fruit of the vine. What about other foods? No, that's not the Lord's Supper. They were messing it up at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 11 when they added other foods to it and called it all the Lord's Supper. And Paul plainly said, 1 Corinthians 11, 20, this is not the Lord's that you're doing here. And as a result of recognizing that, he said, but let me ask you, what kind of vessel do you put the bread on? What did he specify? Out of wood, out of bamboo, out of silver, out of brass, out of gold. What did he authorize you to use? Well, no. I would be just as afraid of somebody who demanded that we have only gold up here for the Lord's Supper as I would be to anybody to deny the specific authority of the Lord too. So that's the kind of background that I had and that leads me into a long introduction about who I am, what I'm a part of, into this idea of the leadership of the church under fire. This writing in 1 Peter chapter 5 beginning verse 1 is a significant statement because therefore he sets forth the idea of this when he says, I the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but for of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. These four verses set forth the idea of the elders, the presbyters, the idea of those that are described in Acts chapter 20 and at verse 28. Take heed to yourselves and to the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed Pascha, the church, to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Notice that in this regard, they were to be people who really paid attention to what was going on. I exhort, therefore, who am a fellow elder, fellow presbyter, is the word used, in reference to their position of age as well as their experience in the gospel of Christ. This is the message that we need to proclaim. This is a message that needs to be honored. And as he talked about the attitude that they would have, as well as the rewards of the future, when the chief shepherd shall appear, he will give you a crown of glory that fades not away, is the real hope of the soul that they were to endure. And so as a result of that, the concept is, first off, pay attention to what you see. Pay attention to what you govern over. 
as he went on to talk about that particular thing in the very next verse, in verse 2. He says, feed the flock, pasca the flock among you. Taking the oversight, there with the oversight is the idea of episkopos, the idea of having the guide and many of the old ancient uh, margins that were in the Bibles in days gone by had the idea in the margin set that these are the guides for people's lives, guides for the way that they understand God's teaching and God's practice to be done in our lives. As a result of that, you be people who are setting forth, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're going too far, too close to the, the border over here. The guide is back this way. Come back this way. Come back this direction. And do it not by having an attitude of domineerance upon these people, but do it in a way that you have the helpfulness that you see, that they can understand and help to understand the word of God as you go along. That's the attitude that you're to have as you work in life. And these brethren here in Acts chapter 20 are noted, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, over which the Holy Ghost made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. This is the kind of thing that they were to do, as Peter describes this in 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2 and through 4. What we have here is the way in which they are to behave themselves as they teach and work with the flock, the blessings of God. Referred to the flock there in verses 3 and 4 in reference to the lot that has been allotted to them as they do the work and study. They are over that particular congregation. That's what uh, later on Brother McGarvey would note that that is a situation where they are over a certain group of people. They're over a group of people, that group. They're not in authority over a group that's beyond their possession. They are part of this group that's in their lot in their guidance, in their help, and they're to offer that kind of assistance to them in a rightful and good and godly way. Well, as a result of that, what we have here in Acts 20, he goes on to say, For this I know, that after my departure, oh boy, what a set of things that we read in Acts 20, 28, 29. This I know, I'm certain of this, that after my departure, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. They'll come in and they will reap and they will chew up and they will eat and they will devour the flock. It won't be there at all if it's left up to them. There will not be one single one of them that remains because those grievous wolves will come in and they will sever these people from their relationship with one another and from God and from you. They'll do their best. And then he goes on to say the following. Grievous wolves shall enter in, not sparing the flock. And from your own selves shall men arise, teaching perverse things to draw away many after themselves. You mean to tell me that from this eldership here in the first century there would be those who would from among them be so set up on pride and arrogance, be set up on their will and their understanding, be set up on the idea of their lack of understanding and thus they would compel those around them to follow me. Is there someone missing in that? The most important one missing in that? The one over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The father puts himself as well as the son in that picture, that as his son came and shed his blood for the remission of our sins, the hope would be for you and me to enjoy that future with the Lord. And these people are said, from your own selves, men will arise and teach perverse things, things that are not right, things that are not according to that guide, things that are not correct. And they will teach them and draw away many after themselves. And then he goes on to say, 
but I commend you unto God and to the word of his grace, which is able to do what? Able to build you up and give you an inheritance, a real inheritance among all them that are the sanctified. When we find ourselves following the way of God, the will of God, and as elders of the church, seeing the needs and seeing the focus, what are those certain things that are going to come against the flock of God? I think that's the prevailing question. And so in the manuscript in the book, you'll see the details that I tried to set forth. How that so many people in our day and time are missing the family, missing a good marriage, missing rearing their children. There were those who came to the Bible studies that we did, the youth program that we did back in February at, at uh, the Crockett Congregation, that noted that so many rear their families and couldn't have been talking about any anybody but it surely cut home right there with us at Crockett put your thumb on their head and guide them that way direct them that way don't let them get away from don't let them go outside you just guide them just like that and you lose them you seek to save them and you will lose them but if you will back off and let decisions be made for God, trust that the Lord will work with their lives. Trust that the hope of the soul will be a part of their prayers, lives, and their marriages, and their choice of rearing their children. Instead of that thumb that's ever pressing on their head, for which they will come eventually to hate you and despise you and do the very opposite of what you want them to do. Don't do this, they said. When elders of the church know that those kind of things are going on, should not some gospel meetings address those ideas? Should not some Bible class teachers be called together in a meeting and say, this is a big problem? It's a growing problem. Can we not work together in this classroom to really change out things and do things for the betterment? Can we not bring some illustrations here that will help these young people realize the betterment of making a decision rather than putting our thumb on them and guide them to do what they, we want them to do and be what they, we want them to be rather than a good decision on their part, a blessing of God on their part. I commend you unto God and the word of his grace which is able to build you up. That's what, that's what Luke writes in that occasion in Acts 20. That Paul is saying, I will guide you, but I'll guide you this way. I commend you unto God and the word of his grace. When we work with people around life, there are a lot of things that we need to decide. There are some things in our lives that we have that we know are going to be problematic to us individually. And elders need to have that thought in mind. What about every individual in this congregation? They're going to be under fire unless they do. But they're going to be rewarded and they're going to be loved and they're going to be hugged. And we're going to talk about them as we miss them back through the years. We're going to miss them. And we are people who are going to go forth in our lives and here's the situation. How do we help them to get overcome their problems with the internet? How do we get them to overcome their problems with the pornography dime? How do we get them to overcome the rough housing work that they do in their lips and their mouths and against others? How do we get them to change? There are two things that are set forth to guide our lives. One thing is the fact that human beings love peace. We like to have things kind of together. We don't like things to be upset. We wouldn't like it for somebody to come and open that door, open that door. Every two or three minutes, uncertain times, open that door, shut that door, open that door, slam that door. We wouldn't like that at all. Sitting right here, we don't know what's going on with that situation. We want peace to be there. Peace that will, as Paul writes, let the peace of God. Philippians 4, verse 7. Let the peace of God 
guide your lives. Let peace guide ye and guard ye in doing your work. Let the peace of God be a way in which you have compassion and love and working together. And let that be the kind of thing that goes on. And be thankful to God for that peace that's there. And how do I do it on a day-to-day -day basis? How do I have that kind of peace that will guard my heart and life? Well, in Colossians 3, the very next book, from Philippians 4, 7, go to Colossians 3 and verse 15. And what do we find there? We find let the peace of God rule your hearts and your minds and be ye thankful. What do we want the peace of God to do? Rule. Ah, when we get down our Bible studies and we get in the opening up of Strong's Exhaustive or others of those word studies and we look at that, we'll see something surprising. This is the only time this particular word is used in the New Testament of our Bible in Colossians 3.15 of rule. Let the peace of God rule. If we assume the only English word, rule, a ruler, a hand, get to right, no, we would be wrong. Because this word means umpire. And we all, if we didn't play the games ourselves, have little grandchildren playing those games now, and we know the benefit of an umpire. You know, in the backyard when we play ball, We'd get upset, I was safe, no you're not, I was safe, no you're not, and we'd fuss and argue, somebody throw the ball and bat down and go home for the day. But with an umpire, it's a different story. Because you've got an umpire there that says, I not only am trained in my umpire work to see a foot hit the base, but I'm trained to use my ears to hear the different sound of a ball hitting the glove and a foot hitting a bag. Therefore, as I look, I'm seeing and hearing at the same time, and that person was safe. No, he was not safe. I know, I, I saw, but did you hear? That foot touched that base first, and then the ball hit the bit. When we have an umpire in our lives of peace, then what happens to us? Whatever word I want to say to you today in this lesson will be guarded by that thought. Is this going to bring about peace? Is this going to bring about help? Is it going to bring about compassion? Is it going to bring about future for good? Is it going to help every family member? Is it going to help every marriage? It's an umpire. What about not only the words said, but what about the deeds that are done? What about where I go, the movies I see, the kind of thoughts that are there implanted for me? If I have that referee in my life, that referee says, you're out on this. You're getting too far away from this. What are the elders to do in 1 Peter 5 at 2? Have that oversight. Have a guard, have a rail out there that holds you in to God's will rather than going beyond it. Now then, if my umpire will say the deeds that you're fixing to do are deeds that will carry you away from God, they're deeds that will take you away from him and away from his will and away from his hope, then of course that's the way that we want to avoid. And so it is that in the work of God in our lives, we have the peace of God to guard us in what we're doing and also to umpire us in what we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. We can overcome those works of the flesh that were mentioned. We can overcome the difficulties. I got to hear yesterday afternoon Brother Paul Sainz's lesson. I thought it was as well delivered as Brother Paul Sainz ever delivered a lesson on the home marriage and the decision making thereof and let this peace umpire your lives 
and be ever more thankful. You'll be thankful because that peace brought about a way that you don't have to apologize for the way that you said things, the way that you did deeds, the way that you acted in that particular public way. You can be a person who says, I did this in earnestness. I did this in my effort to do good. And this is the way that I, I can tell anybody that this is the way to do it. And so you're out of place in saying that this is the way that you want to do your work. So it is that elders can help the situation occur that brings about the kind of peace and joy within the individual's Christian life and the congregation's activities as well as they labor together. Let me close today with the idea in mind and raise it for it might be a question or two from you, the audience of people today. When we think about this, we all have had the experience perhaps of having someone who was worldly minded in the eldership. Miss Jane and I had gotten married over in Jonesport, Arkansas. And uh, we went back to work and labor for the congregation. And it wasn't long until there was a situation developed there. I'd been working there for a couple of years of time, finishing up schooling at Delta State. And the elders of the church were good men. They were godly men. They were wonderful men to work with and all. But there was a elephant in the room you know what I'm saying young people an elephant in the room there's a certain thing that's going on there that nobody talks about and nobody recognizes nobody talks out loud about it but it's nevertheless there and it's going to hurt it's going to hurt everybody that's there I'm downtown I'm working with a man there talking with him about the gospel he says uh, brother Ross and I don't know I don't I don't know why you're concerned about my soul. There goes one of your leaders of the church there. He's going to meet a woman way out yonder somewhere in a cotton field. It's not his wife. Why are you concerned about me? So I said, well, surely that's not so. But I got in my automobile and I drove out. And there on the third row, in the days in which the cotton was not the hybrid cotton of our day that makes as much, well, it was a little short, but the cotton was head tall in that day and time. And dust was a plenty. To make a long story short, when I arrived home that day, shortly after that, that car came to my house. And noted to me that what I thought I saw, I didn't see, and it didn't really even happen that way. And I said, tell me what you thought I saw, and I'll tell you if that's what I <laughs> see. <laughs> and that wasn't uh, exactly what was uh, agreed to do. And so two days later, here's my new bride. We were there at the house, and... A man that I worked with, he was a denominational man, but he was a friendly man, nice man. He came in the house, came up to the door and knocked, came in, and brought me a writ. You have to move by midnight. Well... I've been taught always the providence of God is if with somebody who's faithful to the Lord, following his will, trying to do what's right. So, as he's walking out with tears in his eyes, because he loves me and he hated to deliver that writ against me, in walks another man who's a denominational man there too. He owns a couple of stores there in that town as well as a, a companion town. And he says, you know, you can't keep anything quiet in a small town. And he said, I understand you've got to make a move today. Hmm. I said, well, I'm just getting word of that. And he said, well, let me ask you this. 
do you have a place to go yet? And I said, no. And he said, well, I also rent houses here. And he said, I had a house that uh, became vacant over the weekend, and they're cleaning it up right now. He said, it's right over here on this side of town. Do you have anybody to help you load up what little belongings you have as a young couple? No. Well, I've got five workers that I pay to load up refrigerators and stoves and things of that nature. And so they'll be over here to help you out on the way. By noon that day, everything had been moved. The keys to the new house had been set in my hand. And Miss Jane and I looked up and we said, Lord, you're involved in what we're doing. You've got to be because there's no other way that we can explain this. It's been that way throughout our years. Don't be afraid to follow God's will, teach his way, live a way of peace in your life. Unpire your lives with words and mannerism with peace that have come about, and you'll find that to be the way with you. Long story short about that thing is the next day or two, there was a number of people in the congregation who didn't agree with that as well. Division would come about. But no, division is not what God wants. That's not what his word says that we ought to do. Divide. It took a year. But in a year's time, they repented. They came back to the Lord. Not to me. They came back to the Lord. As a result of that, the fellowship that we began to enjoy once again was restored there. All the brethren were there. And what a blessing it was to have that to happen. I did their funeral services later on. And I did the funeral services of their family members. In the funeral service that I was doing, of one of the family members, I noted in the audience that there were a lot of relatives that were there that were obvious. You know, you have to read some people's faces. You can read... They're not with you. They're not, they're, they're scouring their nose up and they're thinking, what, why is this man speaking here? Why is he talking here at this funeral service? And I stopped the service. And I said, I understand from where you looks that, that there are those here that uh, you don't wonder why I'm speaking at this funeral service. I said, I want to tell you why. This person and I love one another. This person and I work together for the common good of the gospel. That was a mistake that was made. It wasn't against me, it was against God. They held up for wrongdoing, but they repented, which is something that maybe some of you were not aware of is a real important thing to God. For he said, through his son, of that one that repents, God is so, so pleased, more than 90 and 9, which need no repentance. When you do that kind of work, as calls the Lord as an elder, you will be embraced, you will be loved, you will be appreciated. Your name will stand as an influence throughout the years to come beyond your lifetime. You will have that to be a reward for your life because you rule your life with peace and you are guarded by peace. Let's be people then who follow that way in the eldership and let's pass along that word to others who serve the Lord in a way like that. Elders, I exhort you. This is a way to keep that fire from burning you. God bless you, everyone. Thank you for being here today.